Come join me on my second channel, Jaguar Gator 8, where we'll talk all things college football. New video drops every Monday at 6 p.m. Eastern. Click the card in the upper right corner to watch the latest video. And now, on with our feature presentation. In its largest marketing effort ever, PSI Net bought the naming rights to the NFL's Baltimore Ravens football stadium. The branding campaign brought the PSI Net name to millions. January 26, 1999. It's a brand new day in Baltimore because this is the start of a new era. In 1998, the Ravens moved into their brand new stadium, moving out of the outdated Memorial Stadium and to a new stadium in downtown adjacent to Camden Yards where the Orioles play. But for the first year of the stadium, it didn't really have a name. The football stadium was known as the rather clunky Ravens Stadium at Camden Yards, or in some cases, NFL Stadium at Camden Yards. The Ravens were losing a giant chunk of potential revenue by not having a sponsor on their stadium, and by not having someone acquire the naming rights to the venue. That all changed on that fateful Tuesday in January, because on that day, the Ravens announced that PSINet, an internet service provider, would have their name on the venue. PSINet would pay $100 million over 20 years, coming out to an average of $5 million per year to don their company name on the stadium. For a company that was founded in December of 1989, not even a decade before this, to now have their name on the venue of one of just 30 stadiums in the National Football League was a monumental deal. It showed just how far technology had come, and how much the internet had grown that an internet service provider could do this and could pony up the money for this. Now, if that was all that happened, this seems like it would be a complete non-story, right? Having a new name for your venue and selling the naming rights is definitely a big deal especially since a change like this often lasts a while. But name changes are part of the game, and there's nothing really unique about 99% of them. With PSI Net, however, it's a completely different ballgame. Because this $100 million deal didn't just come with putting their name on the stadium. Nope. It came with PSI Net creating an entire website dedicated to the Baltimore Ravens. They were creating a brand new site called RavensZone.net, designed to be the go-to place for any diehard Ravens fans. This was a costly endeavor. This was a revolutionary move. And this was an absolute disaster. Yes, for reasons that will become incredibly apparent as I dive into the details, Ravenszone.net was a catastrophic failure, and in its current form, lasted less than one year, bursting faster than the dot-com bubble. And this is the story behind the biggest technological failure in the over quarter century long history of the franchise. Before I talk about how much of a failure this website was, we need some context to understand just what exactly this website was in the first place, and what it was designed to do. Again, the year is 1999, and the times are changing when it comes to the internet and computers. By 1999, it was clear that the internet was not a fad, and was going to become a major part of society. In 1998, roughly 18% of Americans had internet access in their homes. In 1999, that number rose all the way up to 26%, and there were projections that by the time 2000 hit, it would be at over 40%. Companies and sports teams were going to have to figure out a way to integrate the internet into their business model, and to get with the times and be trailblazers in the industry. And with the Ravens signing that deal with PSI Net, they did just that. Because as part of the stadium naming rights deal, PSI Net was going to create a Ravens website called Ravenszone.net which would become the one-stop place for everything Ravens-related. Even though other sports teams had their own website, no other sports team had done this before in the United States to the extent that the Ravens were doing this. Owner Art Modell said on the deal, This whole partnership far transcends putting a name on a building, with PSI Net Chairman William L. Schrader saying that this deal will become the envy of my industry and the envy of sports franchises worldwide. Dean Bottom, the president of a sports marketing group, said that the deal was trend-setting and cutting-edge, and Jeff Knappel, who was the head of a consulting agency, said upon hearing the deal, it is a much bigger deal than naming rights. It is more complex, and they've done a couple of things that no other team has ever done. So what specifically were the Ravens doing with Ravenszone.net? They were creating a subscription-based service where people would pay money to get access to the website. While you could get access to Ravens information through the main website, BaltimoreRavens.com, that would give you articles and information and would allow you to shop online, RavensZone.net would provide exclusive content 
unavailable for free. You would get webcasts allowing you to watch Brian Billick's press conferences, as well as opposing coaches' phone news conferences. You would get access to content during training camp, including live look-ins at times. And you would even get the ability to email players on the team, in a feature that could not possibly backfire in any way whatsoever. The catch with all of this was that the only way to even have access to this was that you had to have PSINet provide your internet. This was a way for PSINet to increase their reach in Baltimore, and was used it as incentive of sorts to get people to use their company instead of companies that were competitors, like AOL and Comcast. The website would officially launch in April of 1999, saying that it was an all-access pass that no other NFL team had that would allow you to play on CyberTurf, which was probably the first and last time that the word CyberTurf was ever used. Now on the surface, this doesn't seem like a ton of content. Let's look at the two main features that Ravenszone.net gave you, the ability to watch press conferences and the ability to email players. Regarding the press conferences, is that really that much of a hook? Don't get me wrong, it's something, and something is better than nothing. But think of what happens during a press conference. The press conference lasts about 15 minutes. The coach says something, and then it's immediately reported on. You could check the internet or the team website an hour or so after the press conference was done and see what was said, if anything was said of any value at all. And in the absolute worst case scenario, if you didn't want to look online, you could just look in the paper the next day and see what was said. Plus, these press conferences take place during the weekday, so a lot of fans aren't even able to watch them live, especially if the only way to watch it was if you had PSINet, which meant that, if I'm understanding correctly, even if you had PSINet, if you wanted to watch it at work and your work company didn't have PSINet, then too bad. You're out of luck. And I'm sure asking your employer to switch their entire internet provider to PSINet for the sole purpose of you being able to slack off of work would go over really well. As for the other feature of being able to email players, how on earth did you possibly think this was a good idea? You're giving people direct access to being able to talk to players? Anyone who has a Twitter account and looks at the replies for a famous athlete knows just how bad of an idea that is. Seriously, look at the replies under any tweet from LeBron James, and it doesn't take a rocket scientist to know that this system can get seriously exploited and filled with trolls. Now in fairness, the odds that the emails went directly to the player were slim. There was probably someone who vetted every email before sending it off or just deciding to discard it. But considering the fact that PSINet was already bleeding money, as they were in the red every year like a lot of companies around this time, why pay money for an extra staff member when you don't need to, and when this seems like a bad business idea? And if they didn't have someone vetting it, well, let's just say good luck to any quarterback who missed a wide-open receiver and proceeded to throw an interception. That inbox is not going to be pretty. So just to recap where we are so far, because there is a lot more to break down. If you had the subscription, during the season, you could watch press conferences and email players, with the information from the press conferences being relayed in articles shortly afterwards anyways to the general public, and with the emails to the players not even guaranteeing that the player writes back, with you not even knowing if your email got to the player. That's... Well, that's not a lot of content. Gotta be honest, even for 1999, that's kind of disappointing. You could have exclusive video content, exclusive player interviews, or articles made exclusively for that website in a vein like The Athletic. Or you could have extended highlights that the team website doesn't have, such as different on-field angles. You could have exclusive merchandise only available to subscribers, like special pins or hats. But as it is, this just isn't a lot especially to get someone to switch their entire internet provider. And it's even more confusing when you realize that there was a show that aired every Saturday night back then called Report from the Raven Zone. So for the uninformed fan, they'd rightfully think that even if they didn't pay for Ravenzone.net, that they would have access to all the content from watching the show. So the messaging didn't work. Even the Baltimore Sun criticized the website after its rollout, saying that there wasn't exactly a lot on there, and that it was confusing. But okay, maybe it was a bit underwhelming, but what was the price point for this entire subscriber-based platform? It was $20. Okay, I mean, I can think of better things that I'd spend $20 on, but for $20, bucks, I can see why there would be some people that would be interested in this. Heck, I've spent $20 bucks on way less and way worse. Dropping a $20 bill to get access to press conferences and support the team 
and to maybe hope that they expand their content in the future isn't the worst investment you can make. And I can see why there was an audit. Wait, I'm being told something in my ear by my producer. Stand by. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Wait, seriously? No. You're kidding me. Okay. I'll let him know. Uh, guys? I made a mistake. Turns out, I got the price of the subscription-based website wrong. It wasn't $20. It was $20 a month. $20 a month. $240 a year. I'm sorry, what? You're telling me that to get this content, not only did I have to switch my internet provider and pay for that, but I had to pay $20 a month? Do you realize how expensive that is? For perspective, with how inflation is today, that is $35 a month. So imagine today, spending $420 a year to watch a press conference every week that would get reported on immediately afterwards. Back in 1999, an FCC report said that the average monthly price that someone paid for cable was somewhere in the ballpark of $30. With that, you got an average of 51 channels, including a bunch of sports channels where you could watch games. This meant that subscribing to Ravenzone.net was $10 less than subscribing to cable, except instead of getting 51 channels, you got one press conference a week, and you got to email a player that may not get the email. And if that wasn't absurd enough, do you want to know how much DirecTV NFL Sunday Ticket cost? For those who don't know, Sunday Ticket allows you to watch literally every single NFL game from your home. So if you're an out-of-market Ravens fan, this was how you would watch your Ravens play. Guess how much it cost back in 1999 to watch all 248 games? It cost $159. That meant that Ravenzone.net, with its bare-bones content, cost $81 more than literally every NFL game combined. How the heck does that make any sense whatsoever? That's the equivalent of Netflix saying you could pay $10 a month for our entire library, or you could pay $14 a month for just the behind-the-scenes footage of Squid Game, so you don't even get to see the actual show. You realize how stupid that is, right? Heck, for $240 a year, if you wanted to get nosebleed season tickets, you could probably do that. PSINet was incredibly optimistic about the whole thing. President Howard Wills said that within the first 12 months, he expected that 30,000 people would sign up for Ravenzone.net. They thought that 30,000 people would switch their internet provider and then sign up for an additional Raven-specific service at an absurdly high price. Safe to say, that did not happen, as Willis and the company were living in a land of delusion. Because in November of 1999, Seven months after the service launched, guess how many people signed up? A whopping 400 people! They expected 30,000, and they got 400. If you're doing the math, that means they got 1.3% of their projected audience. Imagine setting up 100 chairs for a party, and when the party starts, one person shows up. That's what this was like. As Michael Binko, the senior manager of sports marketing and business development for the company, said on the projections, it's our first foray into the service. Predictions are difficult with a new venture. And yeah, they missed the target by quite a lot. To be honest, I'm surprised they even got 400 people to begin with, as I don't know how 40 or even 4 people would be interested in something like this. But not even 7 months after launching Ravenzone.net and creating this brand new innovative technological advancement of a website, it collapsed. They changed the model to allow anyone, and not just those who had PSINet as their internet provider, to subscribe. And they lowered the price to $50 for the whole year, which is still a lot considering how little they had to offer, but it's about an 80% price decrease from what it was before. So it's something at least. And with the geniuses that were running PSINet, it's no surprise that the company was looking to sell parts of their operation late in 1999, that the company filed for bankruptcy in 2001, and no longer exists today, with their naming rights deal being regarded as one of the biggest naming rights failures in NFL history. So what's the moral of the story here? Subscription-based services can work, but you have to offer something of value, and you have to price it reasonably. And it's safe to say that PSINet did not do that here. Their offerings were slim. There were so many hoops to jump through to even get access to the content. 
and the price point was laughably bad, and might be one of the worst examples of a company pricing a product that I have ever seen. If you're trying to launch a subscription-based service, look at what PSINet did, and then do literally the exact opposite. Because even though the Ravens and PSINet tried to change the game with this model, Ravenszone.net, in the form that they envisioned for it, quickly crashed down from the sky. Get your official Jaguar Gear 9 merchandise by going to jg9shop.com, and be sure to like this video, ring the notification bell, and subscribe down below if you haven't already, as it helps the channel out a lot. And be sure to check out Twitch every Wednesday night at 9 p.m. Eastern for your chance to play NFL trivia and win cash prizes. Link in the description below. If you want to see videos like this condensed down to 60 seconds, then follow me on TikTok at JaguarGator9. To see college football videos, subscribe to JaguarGator8. To see highlight videos of players throughout the history of the NFL, subscribe to JG9 Highlights. Also, special thanks to all of our Patreon supporters for helping out the channel. Your support is greatly appreciated. So you can become a patron and request future video topics in the description below.